Our next speaker is uh, Xiao Lui. Lu, is I do I pronounce correct? Okay. Yes. Uh, Xiao is an uh, assistant professor of marketing at NIU Stern. And uh, I have to say, she's uh, one of a rising star in quantitative marketing and the big data research field. So I have had a privilege to interact with Xiao over the past few years. And what is most impressive about her is that whenever I meet her, she always impresses me more and more and more. So that's really impressive because uh, you know, so I have already have a high expectation, but she just impressed me. <laughs> so today, uh, I'm actually expecting that in spite of my really high expectation, she will somehow surpass my expectation and she will impress me more further. Okay, so shower for, without further ado, please. Wow, that is too high expectation to set for the beginning. You know, you make me extra nervous now, Jim. Well, <laughs> all right, I will take a deep breath and try to go from here. Let's see how I perform, okay? All right, so thank you so much for inviting me. Today, I would like to share with you our project, large scale cross category analysis of consumer review content on sales conversion, leveraging deep learning. So maybe the title can surprise you a little bit because I think this is the longest title yeah. among all the talks at this conference, all right? So um, my name is Xiao Liu, I'm from NYU Stern, and this is a joint work with my colleagues, Dao Kyung Lee and Klaus Renmason, who are both at Carnegie Mellon University. So in the e-commerce industry, there is a consensus that product reviews are very important, right? So according to the survey con conducted by Dimensional Research, 90% of the consumers say that their online purchase decisions are influenced by product reviews. Okay, so I'll do a quick survey here. So how many of you actually read product reviews before you purchase anything? Very consistent with them, right? So they did a good, good job uh, finding the right statistic. All right, so uh, this is also found by my, uh, many marketing and economics literature, okay? So there is a positive relationship between product reviews and demand. Um, uh, however, when we look at the literature, I do find there are some limitations uh, in the prior literature. Uh, the most important thing is that, okay, uh, these papers actually do not observe consumers review reading behavior directly. So they want to quantify the impact of product reviews on consumer conversion or demand. However, they don't observe which reviews are actually read by the consumers. Okay, so if you want to quantify the impact, the quantification might be biased. Moreover, um, most of them only focus on the aggregate measure of consumer response, like total purchases, ignoring vast consumer heterogeneity. Moreover, they only focus on one product category, which limits the generalizability of the findings. And finally, uh, many of them ignore the rich content information in the reviews due to a lack of, uh, of methodology to extract the content information. So, in this paper, we are going to try to fill the research gaps by providing insights on the following research questions. First of all, we want to know, do consumers read review content beyond summer statistics, like ratings? If so, when do they read it? Who reads it? Where do they read it? And what information in the review content do they pay attention to? And finally, the most important thing, what is the impact of the reviews read on conversion? Okay. So to answer those research questions, we set up the following research framework. We want to quantify the impact of the reviews on conversion. Before we can do that, we first have to understand okay, uh, the consumer's review reading behavior. We want to know for what type of products do consumers read reviews? And who read reviews? Where do they read reviews? So this will help us find the boundary condition under which reviews will affect consumers' conversion. And then we will quantify the impact of the reviews read on conversion by looking at the three Vs, volume, valence, and variety. So uh, compared with the prior literature, uh, our contributions are as follows. So we want, to we want to set up the causal relationship between the reviews read on conversion and our analysis is much more generalized well because the, the, the analysis is done on a wide range of product categories. And we also extract the rich content information from the reviews using state-of-the-art deep learning uh, natural language processing techniques. All right, 
So to answer those research questions, we got data from a major online retailer in the UK. So think about this company as Amazon in the UK. All right, many of them, many of you can actually guess which company this is, all right? So this is a panel data of 243,000 consumers over a two month span. So this company literally tracks all the consumers' activities on this website, including 2.5 million page views, 12.3 million review impressions, and 30,000 transactions. A unique advantage of this data set is that uh, we can directly observe which reviews are read by the consumers. So if the consumer wants to read a review, he has to click a button to open the review box, and the company tracks this activity, all right? And the data covers a very wide range of product categories. Uh, there are two major verticals, technology and home and garden, but we have more than 300 different product categories. And for each consumer activity, we actually observe whether this is done on a mobile device or on a personal computer. Okay. So let me first show you some summer statistics. We first construct the consumer online purchase journey. A typical full journey starts with the consumer search. When a consumer type in the keyword and then look at the category information page and then finally uh, click a button to go to a particular product's information page. And if interested, the consumer will choose to read some reviews. And finally, the consumer will decide whether to purchase the product or not. So this is the complete full journey. However, in the data we find that most of the journeys are incomplete. Actually, the complete full journey only takes place 2% of the time. And in contrast, 66% of the journeys only, has, only have this search stage. So the consumer only search for something, then he leaves, okay? And 2% of the journeys only contain the purchase stage. 3% of the journeys only contain the search stage and the purchase stage. So the consumer do not read reviews between these two stages. So if we combine the green and the purple and the blue types of journeys which do not involve review reading, then they take place 71% of the time. So this is to say, okay, 71% of the time, consumers do not read any reviews. Of course, in these journeys, uh, reviews won't matter for their final purchase decision, okay? Uh, however, you may argue, okay, maybe, okay, when consumer only search for something, he's only going to kill some time by browsing a website. He has a very low purchase intention, right? So he doesn't want to purchase anything. Uh, so if we exclude this type of journey, uh, so if we exclude this type of low purchase int intention journeys and only focus on the high purchase intention journeys, then 85% of the time, consumers do pay attention to the reviews. Ah, do I have some guess here? Oh, it's my hair. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry about it. So I graduated, thank you. I graduated from Carnegie Mellon. There was a, cons uh, there was a consumer pro uh, behavior professor there called Jeff Gallock. He has an interesting paper that says, whenever there is an interruption when you watch a TV show, people's uh, like interest for this TV show will go up a lot. <laughs> I, hope that, <laughs> I hope that this interruption will help you, okay, get more engaged with my presentation, all right? So let me continue, all right? So uh, I find that, okay, yeah, a lot of times consumers do not read reviews, okay? Then why is that? Is it because of the problem? Product? Is it because of the consumer preference? Or is it because of the device? We find that, okay, product characteristics matter, okay? Consumers tend to read reviews for those products that are more expensive. And they tend to read reviews for those products that are not very popular. And the popularity here is measured by the total number of reviews available. So the idea is that, okay, if a product has already attracted tens of thousands of reviews, then I don't have to read reviews anymore. It must be a good product, all right? And finally, people tend to read reviews for products that have a lot of questions and answers associated with them, which means, okay, these products, consumers might have a lot of uncertainty about them, so they want to read reviews for them, 
Okay, so I guess, okay, many of you who listened to uh, Stan's talk yesterday from Unilever, you must be reading this table to try to find some <laughs> mistakes from the table. Well, please let me know if you find any mistakes, all right? All right, uh, so here are some examples of the products that the consumers do not read reviews for. Uh, for example, video games, pay as you go phone cards, clocks, okay, so for this type of products, consumers have no interest in reading reviews. However, for floor care products, washing machines, bath frames, and wardrobes, consumers do tend to read reviews for them, all right? Uh, interestingly, we also find that uh, consumer preference matters. Uh, in, during the two month span, about 10% of the consumers always read reviews. And 47% of the consumers sometimes do, sometimes don't. While 43% of the consumers never read reviews. Okay, so there is vast consumer heterogeneity. And finally, we find that device also matters. Remember that, okay, if we only look at the high purchase intention journeys, then 92% of the time on a personal computer, consumers do read reviews. This number drops to 75% on the mobile device. So consumers read actually are less likely to read reviews on the mobile device compared to on a personal computer. All right, so what have we learned so far? We find that, okay, for certain type of products, for certain consumers and on certain devices, consumers actually do not read reviews before they purchase, okay? So of course, reviews uh, won't affect the purchase con uh, conversion in these journeys. Uh, so if we want to quantify the impact of reviews on conversion, we need to look at the right products for which uh, pro uh, reviews matter, and also the right consumers who do read reviews. So this is what we're going to do for the next step. Okay, we're going to establish the causal relationship between reviews read on conversion, and we're going to look at the volume, valence, and variety, and as to variety, we're going to use uh, deep learning natural language processing techniques to extract the rich content information from the unstructured text data. Okay, so this is the only slide with <laughs> a lot of equations, but I uh, have a very quick summary of it. So we are going to look at the impact of review features on conversion using a random utility framework. In the volume model, the review features are measured by the number of reviews read, and in the valence model, uh, review features are measured by the positive reviews read and the number of negative reviews read, and finally, in the variety model, we are going to add six more content dimensions. So for the content dimensions, okay, we think that, okay, what do people write in the reviews? Okay, they are going to talk about price and quality information, right? So for price, this is kind of straightforward. However, the definition of quality can actually be ambiguous. So here, we are going to use the definition given by David Garvin's 1984 paper. So he defines uh, quality as the following dimensions, okay, aesthetics, conformance, durability, features, and perceived quality. So we're just going to use his definition and extract these content dimensions from the product reviews, okay? So the next step, okay, after we define the definitions of the content dimensions, how are we going to extract these content dimensions from the reviews? We are going to use natural language processing models, or NLP models. So the classical NLP models represent content information using word count or n-gram count, okay? So for those of you, so who doesn't know the definition of an n-gram? Okay, everybody, I don't, okay. So n-gram means, okay, a, a sequence of n words. For example, I like toys is a three gram because it contains three words, okay? So uh, classical NLP models used to model uh, word, uh, used to model uh, text data using word count of, uh, or n-gram count, okay? So this is the classical representation. However, as you can imagine, this will give us a very high dimensional but sparse matrix, okay? And to make use of this matrix, uh, we have to do a lot of feature engineering, which is extremely time consuming, error prone, and domain specific. It really takes a lot of time to do feature engineering. And because of this high dimensionality, most of the classical NLP models are just linear models. They cannot take into account any nonlinear relationships between the input variables. So the linear models are include like support vector machine, naive base, et cetera, okay? So as you can see, the classical NLP models do suffer from a lot of uh, drawbacks. So to overcome these drawbacks, 
new deep learning based NLP models have been uh, proposed. So here, the deep learning models can do representation learning. So instead of doing feature engineering, these deep learning models can actually use the raw features in the text data to come up with good representations. And these representations are actually low dimensional and dense vectors, okay? They are not high dimensional sparse vectors anymore. They are low and low dimensional and dense vectors. And because of the low dimensionality, now we can actually use the neural network structure to take into account nonlinear relationships between the input uh, vectors, okay? So here are some examples, recurrent neural network, recursive neural network, and convolutional neural network. I'm going to very quickly explain the intuitions behind them in the next three slides. But before I do that, I want to give you a quick, uh, yeah, quick uh, high level uh, introduction for the deep learning uh, model that I'm using. So according to Joshua Benjo's 2015 deep learning book, a deep learning model is a particular machine learning model that achieves great power and flexibility by learning to represent the world as a nested hierarchy of concepts, with each concept defined in relation to simpler concepts and more abstract representations computed in terms of less abstracted ones. All right, so if you look at this picture in computer vision, if we want to tell whether there is a person or not in this picture, the deep learning model can first learn some low level concepts, like the pixels in the picture, and then, the deep learning models can do representation learning to learn the higher level concepts, like the edges, co corners and contours, objects parts, and then finally, the whole objects, okay? So as you can see, okay, uh, in the deep learning model, the word deep actually means this neural network model has many, many layers, hence the word deep. And the learning just means that it can do representation learning. So we don't have to do feature engineering. We're going to rely on the model itself to come up with good representations of these concepts, okay? So in particular, we use three uh, deep learning neural network mo uh, ne models. The first one is the recurrent neural network. It works with sequences, okay? So to represent a sequence, it first map each word through a lookup table. And then each hidden layer in the neural network will take inputs from the activation of the current uh, lookup table as well as the activations from the hidden layer one step back in time. And finally, the last hidden layer will take, will represent the information in the entire sentence. So this recurrent neural network model can actually simulate the interactions between words in the compositional process. Uh, the second model we use is the recursive neural network model. Instead of working with sequences, this model will work with a tree structure. Okay, so it can take as input phrases of any length, and then to represent uh, phrases, it can use the word vectors as well as the parse tree to get the entire syntactic uh, relations between the words, okay? Um, and the last model we use is called convolutional neural network. So the parse tree structure in the recursive neural network is very powerful. However, it relies on this parse tree, which is not available in most of the settings. So a convolutional neural network model will actually use an internal provided input dependent structure, which does not rely on an externally provided parse tree. Okay, so this model is very good at detecting local clues, which are good semantic relationships between words. All right, so after introducing these models, let me show you the performance. So I compare two classical neural network models with three uh, deep learning based neural network models. And as you can see, after taking into account the sequence structure, the tree structure, and the local clues, all the deep learning based neural network uh, natural language processing models outperform the classical uh, bag of word representation models. Okay, but why is that? Okay, we want to understand what is the intuition behind the compared advantage of these deep learning uh, methods. So we find that the recursive neural network model can actually decipher complicated syntactic structure in the sentences. For example, in this kind of contrastive conjunction structure, or the X but Y structure, if the review says it is good for the money but too flimsy, the classical NLP model will say, okay, this is a neutral sentence because it has both positive and negative words. However, this uh, recursive neural network will know that this author is actually paying attention to the part after the but word, 
Okay, so this entire sentence is actually talking about something negative. Uh, moreover, the recurrent and the convolutional neural network can know that, okay, there are some complicated uh, semantic relationships between words. For example, even if a sentence has many, many negative words in it, it might uh, convey a positive sentiment. Like this review says, uh, without this battery, my phone is useless. It has many negative words, like without, useless. However, this entire sentence is saying something positive. Uh, and uh, these models can also uh, detect negative positive and negative negative semantic structures. For example, if someone says the curtain is the least appealing or it is not bad, okay, if the uh, semantic structures are complicated, the deep learning based neural network models can actually detect this. Okay? So now let me show you the substantive findings. Okay? What do we find from these models? Uh, first of all, we find that reading more reviews on a mobile device has a positive impact on conversion. However, this effect is not present on a personal computer. And interestingly, we find that the, the effect of negative reviews is stronger than that of positive reviews. Okay, so, uh, and finally, uh, we find it's very important for us to know which reviews are actually read by the consumers. Um, if we do not observe which reviews are read, our parameter estimate would have been underestimated by 90%. All right? And finally, in terms of the content in the reviews, we find that aesthetics and price information consistently boost conversion across a wide range of product categories, but the effect on the other dimensions are less consistent. So this suggests that okay, review, uh, readers are actually selective as to which information they pay attention to in the reviews. Aesthetics and price information are very helpful for boosting conversion. And finally, what can marketers do about it? Okay, now after we learn this, what can marketers do? I actually propose a strategy that marketers can leverage for boosting conversion. And the strategy is reordering the reviews. Okay, so we find that price and aesthetics information can uh, systematically boost conversion. Then maybe within the set of reviews with the same rating score, marketers can put reviews that have positive aesthetics information or price information before the other reviews. Here, we run a counterfactual experiment where we allow each consumer to read one review that contains positive aesthetics information before the other reviews. And then we quantify the conversion rate, uh, com odds ratio. And then we compare that with what we observe in the data. We can see that, okay, reordering the reviews by presenting one review with positive aesthetics information before the others is as effective as a 1.6% price cut to increase the conversion rate odds ratio. So think about this. This is a free lunch, right? You don't have to suffer from a lower uh, profit margin. All you have to do is to reorder your reviews, and it can be actually very effective for boosting your conversion rate. Okay, so finally, let me conclude. What do I learn from this project? I find that for certain type of products, for certain consumers and on certain devices, reviews actually do not matter. Uh, however, okay, we find that sometimes consumers read reviews and they are selective as to which information they pay attention to. Aesthetics and price information are very, very important for boosting conversion rate odds ratio. And we find that, okay, reordering the review content might have the same effect as a 1.6% price cut for boosting conversion rate. And finally, we demonstrate that the deep learning based uh, uh, NLP models have both substantive and computational advantages over classical NLP models. Marketers might uh, consider leveraging them for your future projects for your own business. Right? Me. <laughs> so um, the review to me has two components. One is 
uh, consumers, those mm. to perform the review. The mm. second one is the product slash categories who are being reviewed, right? Mm. So to me, is there any pattern for those product tend to be reviewed versus those consumers tend to review? Mm. So for as a marketer, first of all, I need to decide should my product slash category being targeted for social media, mm -hmm. is the investment worthwhile? Mm -hmm. Second is, if it is, who should I target to? Though those customers are tend to spread the word of mouth and make it viral on the internet. Mm. So how can I determine if it's worthwhile to invest in review, and then who should I target? That's a very good question. So. Here we are looking at a kind of a different setting. So this is an online retailer. Uh, it didn't actually invite consumers to uh, write reviews uh, as a reward, like uh, as an exchange for some reward or anything. So consumers just provide organic reviews. So here, uh, the retailer didn't pay anything to the consumers to actually get more reviews. However, um, marketers might actually do that. So Amazon actually gives free products to customers in exchange for good reviews. Um, sometimes, actually, it's a good investment, right? So you want to actually use the reviews as an investment so that that can attract uh, subsequent purchases. Uh, I don't have a real good answer to that question because I haven't done this R RI analysis, like for what type of products should you actually pay to get uh, the reviews, for what type of products actually you don't need to do that because the organic reviews will come by themselves. Uh, but I think, yeah, Mark, uh, I, I'm, the, I'm not a good person to answer this question, but uh, uh, I'm happy to think about this for the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Xiao. You never disappoint me. Thank you so much. <laughs>